Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Time Theft Takedown, Preventing Time Theft for the Hourly Workforce, sponsored by ePay Systems. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them there. I'll post a link to the slides and the exit survey in the chat area once the presentation has started. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast has ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to our presenter, Michelle Lanter-Smith. And thank you, Hester. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. My name is Michelle Lanter-Smith. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at ePay Systems, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our session today, Time Theft Takedown. Definitely time theft is an issue that many of us worry about, concerned about, and takes a lot of our dollars and, and a lot of spend. And we at ePay feel it's something that you can address and truly make a difference, and with the right technologies, get an ROI on that. And today, though, we are going to be talking um, a lot about preventative measures, both from the HR side and from the uh, system and process side, of the house to really help you understand what kind of things you can do. I have a great panel of experts with me today that I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from and I encourage you to ask questions. Now the way you're going to do that throughout today's session is there's a Q&A box uh, on your screen. Just ask your question in there and at the end we are going to be answering questions. So feel free to ask them. So we want to give you the most help that we can today. With me, uh, I have three experts. I'd like to introduce them to you. First is John Gariuso. John has uh, been with ePay for, oh my gosh, about 10, 12 years here, John. Uh, he is an expert in time and labor management. He is our lead sales engineer here. And all of his career as an engineer, he's worked in product development, and um, uh, both RFID technologies, ERP technologies, and for the last 10 years, time and labor technologies. And he specializes in working with uh, our clients, consulting with them and helping them whiteboard and put a solution together that's going to uh, help them uh, address some of their pains, like time theft, something that he works with day in and day out. Welcome, John. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you for everybody that joined us today. Really appreciate your time. Uh, also, we have with us Anna Pager, and Anna is a senior HR consulting partner here at UK Systems. Uh, Anna has a very unique perspective from her work. She has been in business development, she's been in sales, account management, and she has over 10 years in HR. So not only does she really know HR, she's also been in the field. Um, and has experienced it with her peers in terms of issues and things that she constantly runs into. In her last uh, position, she has an H been an HR consultant, working with firms, uh, enterprise, large firms, and also small startup firms. She has developed and streamlined uh, many HR processes for these type of firms through her consulting services. And she is now with ePay. Here at ePay, uh, she is, a, again, a senior HR consultant and she is a regular speaker on our HR series. Welcome, Anna. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me here. And last, but certainly not least, is Dr. Jay Callister. He is our Chief Technology Officer here at ePay Systems. And uh, he has uh, almost 20 years of professional experience in operations management, application development, deployment, and uh, different product development uh, positions that he's held throughout his career. Uh, for the last, I would say, oh, Jay, what? Have you been with ePay for 15 years mm -hmm. now or so? Uh, since 2003. 2003. So it's been 16 years now. Wow, wow, congratulations. Mm -hmm. He is a, I've uh, been working with time and labor the whole time knows it backwards and forwards and specializes in working with companies that have a distributed workforce where those uh, employees are moving around from site to site. So Jay's position here at ePay is he is responsible for defining our technology roadmap to ensure that 
we are meeting the needs of our customers and ensuring our leadership in the workforce management space, solving issues that you're facing with you, uh, daily. Uh, he also leads our uh, very complex time and labor management uh, uh, engagements that we have for large firms and uh, oversees all of our integration. So Jay, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle, for inviting me, and thank you everyone for your time. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Great. Well, let me go over the agenda here really quick. All of you can see what's up on the screen, but we're going to talk a little bit about time theft and kind of define what it is and some of the statistics. Probably you already know those things since you're on the call with us today, but um, quickly we'll move into how you can prevent time theft. Both time theft and we're actually going to also talk about wage theft. Anna's going to talk a lot about that. It's a different type of theft that you need to worry about, wage theft that is, because it causes compliance issues. Um, we're going to talk about ways to identify time theft uh, and potential problems that you have at your site, operational issues that you need to identify. Uh, Anna's going to talk a lot about HR policies and how you can address time and attendance and time theft with HR policies. And John and Jay are going to talk about how you address it with technology. And then uh, finally, John is going to uh, really dive a little bit more into biometrics and some of the pros and cons of the different biometric approaches and how we see that sport time theft and why you might want to consider it. And we'll also talk about some of the laws coming down the pike uh, with uh, BIPA, Biometric Information Privacy Act. So with that, again, keep your questions, keep them coming in, and at the end, we will go ahead and answer as many as we can. Let's get started. So just a little bit about ePay. We are a Chicago-based firm. We're here in Chicago, uh, founded in 2001. And what we do is we provide a full suite of human capital management software and administrative services so that you can manage your workforce from uh, pre-hire, that's recruiting, all the way through to retiring. And uh, we specialize, though, in the workforce. We are workforce experts specializing in the uh, systems that we put in place or help you put in place to manage that workforce and optimize uh, how things work in your operations and to reduce your labor costs. So we've always been in the workforce management space. Our first software was time and labor management is now our flagship. But with that, now we have a full suite, which includes payroll, uh, applicant tracking, HR, onboarding, time and attendance, payroll, and performance management. Our time and attendance technology has a uniquely flexible system that it really allows you uh, to do anything you need to do to track your workforce, which probably is a very distributed workforce that might be pretty hard to track and hard to keep up with. And that's the kind of environment that we specialize in. What sets us apart is our support. We provide a white glove service to all of our clients, included in our price 24 seven all the time. And we have customers write into us all the time with love letters talking about our support and what, how we make a difference uh, in helping them run their business. And because of that, we have a very high retention rate. Uh, so that's a little bit about ePay. Let's get into the today's topics, the session. So on to it, time theft. Why does it matter and what is it all about? So, so what is time theft? And uh, Anna, I am going to start with you. And if you could help us really define what time theft is. Absolutely, Michelle. Time theft is when employee an employee accepts pay for periods that they weren't actually working. In other words, they're either altering their timesheets, um, a friend of theirs is punching in for them, uh, also known as buddy punching, or they're uh, on the clock, but not on site. So that's really the definition of time theft. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what types of situations do you hear about mostly? I know you're always consulting with our clients mm -hmm. and they're talking to you about their concerns. What situations do you hear most common? So a few typical situations is when an employee arrives early, um, they clock in, but they're really not scheduled at that time. They're scheduled later. They're hanging out, not really working, um, but they're collecting for that time that they're already clocked in. 
Um, again, they can also stay late, kind of do the same thing, linker, not necessarily work, or they're not accurately uh, clocking in and out for their breaks. So they're either taking longer time, um, actually always longer time. <laughs> um, that being said, it might seem very innocent, but it's actually inflating your timesheets quite a bit and altering their payroll significantly. Um, other customers regularly share you know, their stories with us and how this has impacted their business. One employer had a situation where <laughs> they actually talk, had a time clock at the entrance and they had a worker that would come in very quickly, clock in and go back into their car in the parking lot and hang out, linger there uh, until they were obviously caught. Um, again, this was probably about 15 minutes, but 15 minutes every day is really significant impact to your timesheet. Uh, and it can cost a lot more than that if you think about it long term as well. So there's all kinds of time theft. Um, we're going to spend most of our time today talking about breaks, uh, taking too long of breaks, uh, the arrival pieces, uh, whether it's early or late, and then, of course, buddy punching. That's where we're going to focus most of our day on. And that really can add up to a lot of money. Just those three things right there adds up to $98 billion every year in the U.S. Um, if we add in some of the other forms of time theft, like just messing around at work and Internet surfing, I think the number is more like $400 billion. So, you know, Jay, this is a staggering statistic. How much do you think time theft is really what you're seeing day in and day out? You're not seeing the $98 billion, but you are working with our clients day in and day out. How are they telling you about some of the stories and some of the costs that the forms they're seen in it? Well, usually, the, obviously, the ex payroll is the biggest part of the employer's expense. So as you mentioned, just even a small, uh, you know, fraction of the time theft can, can transfer to large numbers. But the impact is really much bigger than just small percentage of payroll. It essentially can translate to ineffective, sub-optimized operation. And there are, uh, you know, the, essentially when you have bad information coming in, you know, good stuff cannot come out. So you end up with ineffective accounting. You in, end up with a lot of um, risk and uh, potential lawsuits that can happen because of that. You know, say it, uh, a guard that is not showing up on time but still billing for the time they were not there. And some some issue happens during that 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 absence. There are a lot of criminal actions that can can ensue. So it's a huge issue for our uh, employers. As I mentioned, it's something that um, you know, virtually every, every, every employee I've, I've um, interacted is extremely concerned about, and they're looking for ways to address it. So what do you think are some of the most common misunderstandings about time theft? Well, basically, it's hard to spot, right? It's not an easy problem. Otherwise, it would have been solved. It's a difficult problem, and as I mentioned, it does undermine the efficacy of a corporation. Um, it, it's almost uh, it's an indication that this company does not have the processes or systems together properly. And, and so that's, that really uh, comes down to you know, poor budgeting, poor productivity, and eventually poor morale. So it is a, it is a difficult, but there are solutions for it. And uh, that's what we are very much actively working on. And, and there are ways to improve it, for sure. Do you have any examples in mind of how time theft can affect a company's productivity? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it happens all the time when you're trying to forecast your, 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 uh, your output or forecast your you know, overtime and premium pay. And, you find out those numbers um, are not lining with what your expectation. So, yeah, absolutely. So you basically end up with uh, not meeting your 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 contractual obligations, and so now you have to start covering the, the missing work from somewhere else. And then all of a sudden, you stop incurring additional uh, additional uh, uh, overtime and uh, and liabilities because of that. Wow, that can that can really add up. 
I mean, quickly. That's, that's a huge, huge cost. And I think some companies are moving so quickly they don't realize the cost exposure that they have. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot from the employer to saying, you know what, I don't really care what time my employee comes to work, but I want to make sure if I pay them for eight hours of work, I do get eight hours of work from them. That's a very common statement I'm hearing from clients. But unfortunately, as I said, this is a, these are companies that have actually been around for a long time and I'm still struggling with this question. Let's talk a little bit about one specific one. I want to dive and deeper into buddy punching. I mean, alone that can account for 2.2% of your gross gross payroll. And if you've got a decent sized payroll, that can add up, you know, add up pretty quickly. Um, what do you see customers you're dealing with struggle with the most when it comes to buddy punching? Jay? Yeah, so basically um, there are, I see the two sources of buddy punching. One is that, um, you know, the employee is been terminated by the supervisor and then they're, you know, they are um, basically collecting the check. They haven't informed the headquarters and because most of the time these checks go to the place of employment. So the supervisor is, in, is, is, is collecting that. And obviously that would always result in subpar performance at that location. And the other one is where basically the, the employee is, um, is in cahoots with the with the supervisor, where you know they are hiring their brother or somebody they know, and the employee does not show up or go home after the, the in, after the work, and essentially the collecting check. Again, in all those cases, the client has paid for a certain level of services, and they are not getting those services, and that can be devastating to the to the to the employers. Right? They they could be in liability for that. Uh, as well as you know, losing the business. Oh, so it's much more. Yeah, it's so much more than the the payroll for that employee that's at stake in that in those situations. It's literally, the reputation of the company, the client, uh, the the company, which, which is uh, which, uh, at risk. Yeah. Which is huge and very difficult to measure. But as you said, the service to the customers, you have SLAs and things like that. So that's that's pretty important. John, how about you? You deal with a lot of clients too. What type of uh, bunny punching stories have you heard? Oh, I've heard I've heard quite a bit. Um, I've actually got some experience on it on my own too. But if you just look at one example that just comes to mind is, you know, we had a, a construction company that you know, they had a manual process before coming to us, and they would find that two contractors they were really working together and and would punch each other in or, or manually write down that, yeah, this employee was in because the foreman was running late too. So essentially you had two people that were covering for each other whenever that foreman was late. And think about it, is a foreman really gonna go through and analyze the handwriting and say, that's not your handwriting? He's not, right? He doesn't have the time for that. Um, and what ended up happening is that he finally figured out one day when they all, it was always when he was late that there wasn't the work that was getting done, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't getting done as efficiently as it should have been. So he found out that way, and at that point, we've already lost a lot of money um, from these two employees or two contractors that are essentially cheating the system. You know, I've actually been approached myself as well. I was leaving a company, and um, one of my, my managers was asking me, do you want me to just leave you on there, and I'll just put your hours in there? I was like, no, like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not right, you know, on an ethical standpoint, but also, why are you even asking me that, mm -hmm. right? So... You know, it does happen, and it's not just from an employee level. It could be at that manager level as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with technology, you know, though we're getting better and better with our technology, employees continue to get more and more creative. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, employers, they want to pay the employees for the work that they actually do. No more, no less, right? That's, that's the ultimate goal. They're not, they're not trying to cheat the employees out of money that they don't work. They're trying to pay them exactly what they work, and again, no more, no less. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other examples, Jay or Anna, that you can think of in terms of where you've seen um, this happening quite a bit? Usually, is it? Go ahead, Jay. Uh, all I just want to say is it is very common for us to to hear from our clients that they are dealing with a case that they they want us to 
collect the data and pro, you know provide information. This is this is this used to be probably more rare uh, ten years ago. Now I'm seeing just about every other month some kind of uh, inquiry about this information. Uh, the other one which is not exactly body punching is where the supervisor changed the rate of the activity for the for the employee. So you know, not having a, a system that can audit that can result in additional payments to the employee uh, because of the incorrect rate manipulations. Right, and that's more of a wage theft issue more than a, than a time theft where the employers are actually stealing the money from the employees versus the employees stealing time from the employers. Right. But you're right, Jay, that is, an also, that is also a big issue as well. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit because yeah. there's different types of time theft. So, but before we leave, uh, leave the topic of time theft where employees are stealing time from the company, and there's a few other areas, and, and one of them is uh, time rounding. Um, Jay, can you talk a little bit about uh, what we need to know about time rounding? Yes, this is actually, I've heard this thing from a lawyer, that every time you see time cards when everybody works exactly eight to five, then there's a problem that you know there's something going on there because nobody has atomic clock, right, to show up to work exactly at the same time. So this, uh, this time rounding where the entire you know, staff have exact same time is really a good indication of not tracking people. And obviously, um, the other side of it is, um, there are people who game the system around time rounding where in, typically you can have um, the, the time rounding is, is symmetrical, meaning some people want some they get more, some they get you know, a couple of minutes early, come from late, and it's all rounded to the same time. And for 95, 98% of the folks on an ongoing basis, it's a wash. But then you have a handful of employees who always come in just like a minute or two early so they can get 15 minutes more. And it, it needs to be, you have to have a process to monitor that because I've seen a class action situation with a small client, just 100 employee, where somebody was uh, added, um, you know, in a, uh, was, 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 sorry, being uh, like a 40 or 50 hours in a year because of the rounding. And they went to a lawyer, and lawyer, without talking to anybody else, assumed, no, if this happened to this one person, it's happening to more people, so start the class action. But then when we look at the data, we found out that in the entire company, there was only two people who have this issue. Everybody else, it wasn't. So it was... It wasn't a you know it wasn't a theft, but I'm saying is it can lead if you don't have accurate way of measuring it or tracking it, you could end up getting into the situations where you create problems because because it's an opaque issue. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to time rounding, there are some laws. Anna, can you fill us in? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. According to the FLSA, you can round employee time to a quarter hour of work. You can round down an employee time from one to seven minutes, but you must round up employee time from eight to 14 minutes and count it as a quarter hour of work. Do not round the employee hours to avoid paying overtime wages by all means. You want to allow your employee, a lot, employers need to allow their employees to round their start times and stop times, but according to the federally approved guidelines, which I just kind of talked about. So that includes the intervals of five minutes, uh, to the nearest one-tenth of an hour, nearest one-quarter of an hour. Um, and what that means is that the start and stop times must be rounded both up and down depending on the punch time so that the rounding is never used to withhold pay from the employee. And again, you have to be impartial with your calculations. Um, you want to ensure that clocking in a few minutes early or late doesn't count towards early or late payroll calculations for your employees and prevent small amount of overtime from adding up, counting it to a daily or weekly overtime hours. And again, ghost employees are another serious issue that, that have been brought up. The employees that no longer work for an organization to still be counted, as John had mentioned earlier, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how often it comes up um, but creating an employee that doesn't exist, this is often uh, done by a uh, higher up manager that can actually get away with that and occurs with employees that actually work 
or that they clock in and then of course leave for the day without actual work. And that obviously is going to be, you know, the work is going to show ultimately if there's no one doing the work. Yeah. Jake, can you share some thoughts with us on, on, uh, on this topic on ghost employees? Sure. A um, couple of things I want to mention. One is like about messing around. It's, it's not unusual to see situations where the employee come to work, but they don't do anything. They just sit, you know, on the chair the whole time or sleep at, 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 at their desk. Uh, or they leave and come back end of the shift and punch out again because they live close to the, to the place of employment. Um, the other one around, um, you know, time rounding or not, is related to the people where they, for example, they ask their friend to punch them in in the morning or in the evening or certain day of the week. Again, all of these things have patterns that is, you know, we can recognize, but you know, without visibility to it, it's really hard to catch them because it's just happening behind the scene and there's nobody really kind of uh, watching it actively. So you have those situations popping up, typically in a situation where there aren't proper tools or procedures in place for the, with it from the employer. Yes, absolutely. And as Jay said, he gave you some examples that can span from messing around to surfing the internet to having another business, all of this. All of these things add up to that $400 billion that I that I mentioned before. Anna, let's talk a little bit more about time card fraud before we leave this topic. Um, how? What are some of the bad habits that you've seen in companies when you're consulting? Well, time cloud fraud is manipulating hours or basically lying about the number of hours actually worked in a day. Um, so cell phones are obviously a big culprit of some of this theft, uh, excessive personal time, you know, floating around, messing around like, like we just talked about. So what you want to do is set limits for your cell phone usage or prohibit them during meetings, trainings, or even customers uh, when they're present. Um, ban them from being used in production areas or when operating machinery. Um, it's kind of unsafe to do that too. Uh, define it in your standards of behavior and address the misconduct directly and make sure it's efficient and of course consistent. So with cell phones, do you recommend having a cell phone policy? Absolutely. Have a, have a very clear understanding of what that policy is. What do you guys of all of these different Times of types of time theft, which do you think our customers struggle with the most? I personally see, I think, a lot of ghost employee issues come up. Um, that's one that, you know, uh, is identified frequently. Uh, I think most of our clients, because it's an electronic system, mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier to, you know, have an exact time of clocking in and clocking out. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing how if you let go of a manager and suddenly five other employees no longer are getting paid, Absolutely. what's going on, right? Exactly. And it, we've seen that with, with some customers and, and heard those stories from, uh, from potential customers as well that that happens, that, you know, they have an untrustworthy manager who is you know, providing ghost payroll for either himself or his family, and they're not really there, and then he's gone, and so are five other people that were never there. All right, let's talk more now about the cost of time theft. And John, what do you think is some of the, or the impact that time theft has on productivity? Well, there's a lot that it, that it, that it impacts, right? One is a dollar amount. If we look at just in total what it, what it costs U.S. employers, it's about $400 billion in that lost productivity, right? And your bottom line really feels that cost because it's, it's hard to imagine this result down to the road with, with the, you know, the right insight early on, right? And if only 10 to 15 minutes here and there, you know, it, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it really starts to add up when it's more than just one person, right? Mm -hmm. When you start having, you know, we talked about the example of the employee that was parking their car, running in, clocking in, and, and waiting 15 minutes. What do you think the next person that saw, saw them doing that did, right? They started doing it. And then the next person and the next person starts snowballing. And now you're not looking at just one employee 10 to 15 minutes, you're looking at 10 employees at 10 to 15 minutes. That starts to add up. Yeah, yeah. So for the folks on the phone, a lot of these folks, you guys listening, are, are the messengers. You're going back to executives to say, hey, this is something I, we really need to worry about. Can you give us a little more details of where 
this productivity, these losses down some? Yeah, so you're really looking at the employee's annual salary, and then you're dividing it by the amount of that time lost, right? Um, so for your labor man hours, that's going to measure the inputs of a company's workers, while productivity is going to really identify the outputs that the labor produces, right? And Jay had mentioned uh, um, something earlier on that, that kind of led into that of, hey, if they're not working, I see, I see a result of more overtime because we need to play catch up for that, right? And when productivity declines, you know, it can lead to lower revenues and increased labor expenses. So not only is it, you know, and have more overtime, but now I have less productivity, which means I'm not producing as much as I should. Right? Absolutely, John, you hit the nail right on the head with that because ultimately that uh, labor is intended for a purpose and then now you're playing catch up and overtime costs. Very costly. Yeah, I mean, especially yeah, especially when you have orders to fill, if, you know, look from a manufacturing standpoint, and I used to work for a company that we manufactured battery chargers and battery testers, you know, we would get orders from our customers and we had um, results that we needed to do. We had our lines and they needed to produce X amount per hour and we kept track of that. And if any of that, you know, went, went lower, we had to figure out why is it, right? Is it something in our process or is it somebody that slowed down that process? Mm -hmm. I just want to add, um, these productivities are really real numbers. I do believe these are actually, you know, the losses. But there are also some intangible losses that are, you know, I don't know if anybody has been able to, to, to quantify it, things around uh, reputation of those organizations, losing their, your client because you were not able to fulfill your, your, your contracts, um, creating liabilities and risk where you, you know, somebody got injured because the, the, the employee was not where they're supposed to be. So there's a whole host of intangible costs around risk and, and, and company's reputation that is, I think, would be very significant as well. So let's, let's figure out the tangible costs. Um, the APA says that uh, the average employee steals four hours and five minutes every week. So if you take that four hours lost every week, that's 16 hours a month. That's two, two days a month. Two lost work days per month is actually 24 lost work days per year. That's five, almost five weeks of lost work time per year all based on a very proven, researched uh, four hours and five minutes a week is what it starts with. And that's from body punching, messing around, all that kind of stuff. But five weeks in employee that you're losing, that's a lot of money if you just times that by your payroll. So, you know, this is costs that are, that are real. Um, if we go on to the, the next slide, you can see this is another way that you can really calculate um, the cost of, of time theft. Um, John, what, what does it look like over the course of a year from using this methodology? Yeah, so if we look at it from this methodology, if we calculated that it's four and a half hours per week per employee, and you know, by the average hourly wage, you know, that puts us at about $12,000 a year, right? And that's just calculating one minute of time theft a day for a company with 250 employees where you know the average actually sits at about six minutes of time theft per employee so when you really think about that you know it's that cost you know at 250 employees you know we're just doing one minute here but if you imagine if you do it at six minutes at six times that that really starts to add up you know that's you know upwards of, uh, of eighty thousand dollars that you're going to be losing right there if you're 250 employees imagine you're 500 imagine you're a thousand Imagine you're 2,000 employees. Imagine you're 100,000 employees. That number becomes very staggering. And a lot of times, and a lot of customers, that could be the, uh, the difference between being profitable and being in the negative, right? So being able to nip that in the bud is going to be very important. Um, and going back to the, to the other one for the, and really just this one, for the four and a half um, you know, hours per week, that seems pretty accurate. I remember we had a, an employee here who had, was taking excessive smoke breaks. Right, he would be gone once every every hour, maybe hour and a half. But call it, he takes ten smoke uh, smoke breaks in a day. That's you know 
call it five minutes to get down to the smoke area, five minutes to come back on, up, that's 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by 10 times, that's 100 minutes, an hour and a half just right there, right? Mm -hmm. So th you can think about that too, as you know, excessive breaks could be an issue along with as part of that time for them as well. Right, right. So the bottom line here is the very top of this, this page. If you are doing manual timekeeping and you're thinking, oh, I don't have to pay for a system, it's free, right? It isn't free. You're paying for it. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you're paying for it. All right. Something that I'd like to talk about is wage theft, right? So this is kind of flipping it on its side, right, Anna? Absolutely. So the main difference between wage theft and time theft is wage theft is more from the employer perspective. Um, it's a huge pitfall that you want to avoid. It's time theft. Um, used by the employee. So results are stealing of paid hours from the employer. Uh, or, or should I say that's the opposite of what it is. It's a significant financial risk um, because it, it leaves you out of compliance. Um, I'm sorry, wage theft, on the other hand, <laughs> is when the employer is stealing the time theft. So time theft is when the employee is stealing it. Wage theft is when the employer is stealing theft, uh, the, the, the hours. Um, so it's often not necessarily deliberate, but it can be done um, from, you know, from misclassifying of your employees. We have case studies that show that, you know, 450 large firms each pay over, pay out over a million dollars or more in wage theft settlement over the course of the year. Uh, according to the U.S. federal courts records, approximately 100,000 federal lawsuits have been filed under the Fair Labor State Standards Act since 2000, with filings in the state courts climbing ever higher. Um, cases around unpaid overtime wages are flooding HR news stories lately. So you've got to make sure you guys are aware of these compliance issues and the risk. So this uh, wage theft matters, right? Yeah. We used to just talk about time theft. And now when we do these type of educational events, we talk about wage theft too. And, and not because it's just plain old wrong, but it exposes you to lawsuits. And lawsuits uh, cost a lot of money. So it's another way of just really increasing your cost. And I know as HR professionals, it's probably something that keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. You know, between civil lawsuits with uh, state and federal cases, there's over 5,000 cases have been brought against large employers, generating 18 billion in penalties and civil fines. So uh, this has all happened since the year 2000. And it just is increasing and going mm -hmm. up. So let's talk a little bit more, Anna, about how wage theft happens. And um, you know what do you what do you guys what are you seeing in your so, world? So overtime violations it's really the result of failure to pay your non-exempt employees for for their overtime. So any hours over 40, uh, they should be paid overtime. So working off the clock is another violation, and it incurs when the employee you know starts a little early, um, having doning or doffing periods where the employees are getting ready for work. Um, how the employers treat this time is critical and it needs to be compliant with the state and federal rulings. Remember, one thing I'll always say is time work is time paid. Minimum wage violations uh, pay the employees the wrong wage for the work that they're performing. And of course, employee misclassification, which I think is a big one. And whether that's intentional or non-intentional, either way, there's an FLSA test that can be done to make sure you're classifying your employees properly. You know, and a couple of these things really, with the right systems, you shouldn't have these issues. Absolutely. Minimum wage violations, you should be able to have a system that when they go into a certain local uh, that has a certain wage, like the city of Chicago mm -hmm. here, boom, they get that minimum wage. That your time and attendance firm should handle that. Same thing with overtime, but those rules should be uh, very flexible and be able to be placed in there. John, did you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, there's even the, if a manager is changing the employee's rates because they want, or changing the hours as well, mm -hmm. where they're stealing from the employee because they want to stay within their budget because that manager gets a bonus if they stay within their budget, right? Yeah. That's another form that, that this can happen. Um, so you want to be careful of things like that as well to be able to identify them. So speaking of identifying it, 
we want to really think about how can we prevent it. Um, Jay, how, what are the ways that employers can monitor uh, wage theft and prevent it? There are, um, basically it starts with actually tracking it. You need to track the time. You know, you, and it needs to be tracked as close to as, you know, as it happens. It shouldn't be somebody's thing, you know, end of the day and entering the time. It needs to be at the time of the start of the work and end of the work. Those times need to be tracked. And once you start tracking it, then a lot of options opens up to you in terms of ability to know it's been, if it's being manipulated or if it's, there are some unusual patterns in it or if those hours are jiving with the output you're expecting that should be happening. So really the starting point is having a good tracking system and processes for monitoring your attendance. Okay. Now, once once you start doing that, then essentially a lot of the like ninety percent of the the the, the 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 problem becomes under control because now you have data to respond to, something to 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 improve on versus you know trying to kind of guess things or try to do it in an ad hoc random fashion. Yeah, it sounds like that's the key here is having the data and being able to track first. Um, and it's the easiest way to curb it. Now, you can do it with systems, and I'm going to return to Jay, you, and John in a bit to talk about systems to curb it. But I'm going to go to Anna, our HR expert, and, and talk about how do you combat it um, from an HR level. So the first thing you want to make sure you have is you have a clear and specific time and attendance policy. Um, you want to make sure your employees know what's expected of them. Um, so create the procedures to enforce these policies as well um, and want to make sure you're using biometric time collection devices so that you can really crack down on any buddy punching. And finally, you need to have a good reporting structure and analytics tools. Okay. So communication, I would imagine, is pretty important. Absolutely. Uh, I imagine that's 101 for mm -hmm. HR, good HR rules. Um, what type of things do you think you're, that you usually put in place when you're consulting in terms of curbing time theft and sure. communication? So first you want to communicate it both orally and written um, in, in your attendance policy and make sure you refer to it often and make sure that your employees know where to look. Oftentimes it could be just that simple. And where um, should it be? So it, it should be in their handbook. It should also be communicated during their orientation and throughout. And how often should you update the handbook and send it back out? Oh, as often as needed. So if there's um, a, an update that needs to happen, it should happen. Ultimately, you know, there are times where you take notes and then do it throughout the year, or you just do a revision every year. So that's that's really the handbook. <laughs> should, should employees sign a handbook? Absolutely. There should be a handbook acknowledgement. So just writing it out in a time of a, a, a policy isn't going to help. You need to have them acknowledge that policy as well. Um, and new employees, like I mentioned, have them read through the handbook and sign off on that acknowledgement throughout their orientation. And ultimately, you have to hold them accountable. If you're not holding them accountable, then you might as well throw the entire handbook out. Because what purpose does it serve them? So, so I was going to ask you, what kind of things can you do to hold them accountable? So as an example, you can use a point system, um, and that could be, you could have them lose a shift or even loss of employment if it's that severe. Um, again, sharing the policy is critical and reminders to all employees, but again, consistency, constant consistency helps reinforce company uh, consequences. And again, as we talked about earlier, whenever there's an update necessary to your policy, you want to update it and communicate it again. So are you saying I can't have my favorites? <laughs> no, absolutely no not. Favorites. No favorites. Absolutely no favorites. Not good. Okay. Lawsuit about to happen. That's it. That's you got good. it. All right. Good. Well, um, what are some different ways then that employers can um, address it? Uh, and it, with the HR policies, you know, you kind of talked about a few of them, but I, I know you got more that. Absolutely. So within the context of other time and attendance related policies, 
or you can have it as a standalone section within your company rules. Um, and it can also be housed under your attendance and punctuality policy, um, best, overtime, timekeeping policies, standards of conduct, just to name a few places where you can keep it. Um, so with uh, these guidelines, which are really good around time theft, what should companies include in this written material? So you want to make sure you're including the consequences and be as specific as you really feel that's necessary for your company. Um, an example of this would be non-exempt employees must accurately record the time they begin and end their work, as well as the beginning and end time of each meal period. They should also record the beginning and end time of any split shift or departure from work for personal reasons. Overtime work must always be approved before it is performed. Altering, falsifying, tampering with time records, recording time on another employee's time record may result in disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. So how do you think these type of tools, HR tools in your toolkit, compared to anything else you see in sorting time theft? So, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? So, so these uh, tools where you're putting them in the handbook mm -hmm. and things like that, how much impact do you think they have in comparison to other things, maybe some technology things that we're going to talk about here? So personally, I think you kind of need both. Okay. You need to have good policies and procedures in place, and you need to really um, be the firm parent, I guess, so, so to speak, to make sure that you're um, correcting the actions immediately. But without the tools to measure what has actually taken place, it's really hard to determine whether you have uh, buddy punching, ghost punching, um, whether people are actually clocking in on time or, you know, are they really late or, yeah. you know, it's so I feel that you really have to have both yeah. in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got some policy examples up on the screen right now. Um, do you want to make any comments about some of these examples? So general inclusion, loosely referencing the action associated with time theft. Uh, examples are employees caught breaking any state or federal laws, including employee theft for private or company property, or falsifying timekeeping records with termination. Will will be may not be given a warning um, if this is not exempt. It is the non-exempt employee's responsibility to sign the time record to certify the accuracy of all time re recorded. Uh, under standards of conduct, acknowledging it as a baseline exception of company policy and behavior, accurately reporting time worked is a responsibility of every non-exempt employee. Federal and state laws require the company to do so and to keep an accurate record of time worked in order to calculate employee pay and benefits. Time worked is all time accurately spent on the job performing assigned duties. And explicit timekeeping policies specify addressing behavior that is def deficiently from time theft. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you talked about in there when you were read it off, you said about signing a time card. John, what do you think about signing time cards? What do you see? I think it's a great policy because what you're doing is you're having the employee sign off to say, yeah, I've looked over my hours and I agree to these, right? So now if they were to come back with a lawyer and say, hey, you know, you're not paying me correctly. Well, how come you signed off, you know, this one, 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 right? So now you have proof behind it that, you know, hey, you signed off that you were okay with these. So now you're coming later on to me and telling me there's something wrong. Um, you know, and also, I guess that was it. Yeah. No, <laughs> I just looked at our time. I was like, oh, we got a lot to cover and yeah. get to the top of the hour. So one more thing on enforcing these policies. This is tricky. It's not so easy. No, it's not. It's not, especially when you have so many people. Um, again, you want to make sure you're firm with your procedures and absolutely no exceptions. You want to be proactive and reinforce it. Avoid having to react with consequences. And again, be consistent. Absolutely no favorites at all. Um, again, consistency is key within any HR policy. Um, consider implementing an employee point system. It will automatic could automatically tally points for absences, late arrivals, early departures, as compared to the actual schedule. And it can accumulate 
you can accumulate points either positively or negatively, and it can be customized based on your actual company policy. So note to listeners, a couple of things we've said in a system you look at, you want to make sure you can sign off on timesheets or employees can sign off on timesheets. You want to look at having an employee point system that you can leverage. Those are, those are all key things. And one other thing that has really dropped coming into play right now Absolutely. is BIPA. Absolutely. BIPA, it, 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 you stole it right out of my mouth. <laughs> BIPA, BIPA is just basically, it, it's a, actually a policy that's been around for years, but recently an attorney kind of uncovered it recently in the last couple of years. And it's really a simple lawsuit. So all the employers have to know is for the states that it's affecting, and particularly Illinois has been hit hard by it, um, but all you have to do is have a policy outlining what your biometrics policy is and have the employee acknowledge it. And I would just do it in their onboarding. Yes. So BIPA stands for Biometric Information, Information Policy Act. Illinois is the state you got to worry about right now, but look out, California is not far behind. It's also in Washington and Texas. But in Illinois, man, you got to have people, so you're going to use biometrics, white collar, blue collar, gray collar, they need to sign off and say, I agree uh, to using biometrics. Uh, otherwise, it's not a good thing. The, the, the lawsuits are coming quickly. So um, you can also look at having that right in the onboarding system, uh, which you know is, is key. You can also look at having that signed off right on the clock. All right, so we can talk about utilizing time and attendance tools too, John. So I wanna turn it over to you. Let's talk about systems. What can you do to stay you know, on top of time theft with systems? Well, you know, there's a couple of different things. When you look at time clocks, you may wanna look at using biometrics, whether it's facial recognition or fingerprint technology. Um, and the key there too is with the biometrics is, you know, not storing those images, you know, wherever they are, right? So you're looking for a system that, that's not going to be doing that where it can't be reproduced by looking at something in that system. So one, it's got to be encrypted. Two, it's got to be really a score of those points to, to, um, to be stored so that we can, or not me, but systems can actually find that, that, that information and find that it really is that person. Why is biometrics important for that is that I can prevent buddy punching now because now I can see who's actually punching in and if they really are that person, I can see that as part of that process. When you start looking at a, a mobile app, you want to make sure that you can do facial recognition on there as well, as well or even other types of biometrics. But you can also look at um, ensuring uh, you know, the employees are where they're supposed to be. So you want to capture their GPS coordinates so that you know they're on site and they're not at home or 10 minutes away because they're still stuck in traffic, right? Um, so you want to be able to capture those GPS coordinates and maybe you set up it to, to geofence where they're not in the area, they don't, they're not able to punch in or you track them throughout the day to make sure that they're actually where they're supposed to be. Um, what about analytics? How can analytics help you? Well, analytics help you identify, you know, where some problem ch childs are, right? So you want to look at maybe down to the employee level or down to specific locations. So you want to be able to have a system that can look at the information, analyze the data for you, but then it also starts to identify, hey, here's a problem area. Now I can know I need to go and dive into that data so or that data point um, to see what's really going on, right? And how that helps is that you're going to be able to streamline the process. Your managers are going to spend less time in, in the system making corrections because we all know that your sins of your time and labor show up in payroll every single time, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, helps with error corrections, but also looking and monitoring, do I have employees that are constantly punching in without, you know, their facial, right? Or, or is somebody manually adding that punch in that system? So really being able to, to look at that data and analyze it and find out where exactly those problems are. That's really a key in the system that you're looking for because it's hard to look at a thousand punches that happen in a week, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody that's, but, you know, a person cannot look at that and identify that, hey, there's a problem with, with Michelle because I always see that she doesn't have a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Which is true. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so it, it's hard to look at that manually. You want to have a system that's actually running through the analytics and, and really looking for those uh, data points to identify that for you. Yeah. Jay, I, I know this is your specialty, analytics. Do you want to add? <laughs> Oh, that's a, I completely agree with John. I mean, this is a, a 
this is a tool that you need to be able to find the patterns and be able to identify who, where, you know, when it has happened. And what we, you really find when we did this, do this type of analysis, which is really interesting, is <clears throat> 80 to 90% of the noise get generated by 10% or 20% of employees and managers. So the, the issue is not uniformly distributed, not everybody doing it time theft. There's a handful of uh, exception managers or employees who are creating all the noise. And the analytic really allows you to find and identify those managers. And sometimes it's not nefarious. Sometimes it's just training issues or the way they've been instructed. But it's just that you can really see all these low-hanging situations and address them so you can really quickly come to significant improvements with analytic tools. Okay. I think we have a, a webinar poll. We're getting to the end, but we really continuously do our research and we like to know what people are using out there. So go to your keyboard right now, if you will, and just that, tell us what type of biometrics are you using? Are you using fingerprint biometrics? eye or retina biometrics, facial biometrics, or you're not using any biometrics to track uh, people and exactly who you say they are. Yeah, so we'll give it a, a few seconds while that's going, and then you know while that's happening, we can talk a little bit about some pros of biometrics. Okay. Um, so you know, when we look at some pros of the biometrics and, and how we look at that, we can identify, you know, different types of, of, of ways to do the biometrics with retina and iris scans, fingerprints, palm prints, and hand scans, voice pin, uh, prints, facial scans. Um, you know, the biometrics is more secure than it is for somebody to just take a swipe card and swipe in and clock in, right? I can give my card to Michelle, Michelle can clock me in. Um, same with an RFID card or, or proximity card. I can hand that card to my friend, he can go in and, and, and punch in for me. When you have biometrics, you know, that's unique to that user and you don't have, um, you, I can't reproduce Michelle's face, right? Or her fingerprint, actually nobody can reproduce Michelle's fingerprint, but um, you know, you can't change that, right? And that's kind of the key. You know, even with facial technology, you'd be surprised, you can grow a beard and, you know, even though you register without uh, any facial hair, still has the ability to recognize you because it's looking at those different depth points on your face to identify it, right? So it's very unique and doesn't allow you to really uh, uh, change that. So it becomes more secure in that sense. All right, well, we've got some questions, not a lot of time, but let's see what we can do. Um, the first one is, is um, my question is related to hourly employees. This comes from Matt, who work remotely. Boy, that's kind of our sweet spot. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle an issue where you know the employee is not working but considers himself on call and available to work but is not actually working? So I, I think I need to have a little more clarification because if the employee themselves consider themselves on call, it's not officially on call because there are on call rules. So that's, some, that's gonna be separate. But if they're just considering themselves on call, and they're not actually working, that that is time off the clock, in my opinion. Okay. So Andrea asks, I am the HR manager at a healthcare company with traveling doctors and medical assistants. Every employee, uh, I just lost the question. <laughs> Every employee has their own time fob, okay, their own time fob. However, a few of the medical assistants stay on the clock but disappear from their desk. What is the best way to approach the employee with a verbal warning? Um, you kind of have to get more clarifications on where they disappear to. Are they just going to the restroom? And how? what's your policy in regards to that? And then yes, a verbal warning, should it be something that they're in violation would definitely be in order, followed by whatever your company policy is in place. So whether it be verbal, written warning, second warning, whatever your company policy is in place. And document, document, document. Yes. Document once more. Yes. So the next, Mac has given us some more. Um, so the employee, this was the first one, is clocking in from home using, I'm not going to say the name, uh -huh. <laughs> using a competitor's electronic time system and is not clocking out, for example, when attending church or driving into the office. So, um, I mean, guys. 
I, I just want to address that one a little bit. Just, I mean, sometimes we're, de we're dealing with a lot of physics. If your your collection device is not capturing the location of you, then you know, there's nothing you can do about it. There are things like IP filtering where you can say, okay, only from this IP address you can, so if they need to be at office, you know, it's the IP address of the office, not the home address. So there are tools to limit where you can punch in. Otherwise, it really needed to move to a mobile system with geofencing that ensures that this person has a place of work when they are punching in. All right, I'm gonna take uh, one more question. Um, how can our managers enforce all employees are clocking in and um, uh, their staff and stop clocking in early and clocking out late for scheduled shifts? So I guess, uh, Jay, I'm gonna turn this over to you because I know you're working a lot with uh, yeah. our clients. If yeah, I mean, if your people, employees are punching early, you're going to have to pay them. So they're ready. You need to basically instruct them not to punch in until a certain time. But uh, this is a, this is a big problem. I mean, but you need to you need to discipline or you need to manage the employee. Otherwise, um, if you just allow that bad behavior, one thing I would not suggest is locking them out of the system. That is never a good idea. You want to always collect, uh, correct, uh, collect it when they arrive, but if they're arriving too early, you need to give them a warning. You can't, uh, but you cannot knock the time off. And this is a great, great point where you may want to install a uh, employee point system where, hey, you're early, you start to accumulate those points, and now you reach a threshold, and now you get that verbal. And then you reach the next threshold and you get that written, the second yeah. written, then, you know, termination. So an employee point system is one way to really help that situation as well. So that, again, it's a non-biased view towards the employee and their attendance. I don't have a favorite there. I'm just looking at the data. It's telling me you're early all the time or you're late all the time. And now I'm accumulating those points and now I can give you that verbal. Right. And one thing I would like to add, too, is if they're early, are they actually working or are they just hanging out? Again, time work, time paid, right? So if they're early, they don't necessarily have to be working, but are clocked in. So again, rounding rules could apply here as well. So if they're just a few minutes early, that's fine. But if they're a half hour early and that's not the time when they were scheduled, that's a different story. So wrapping up, Jay, I'm going to ask you to wrap up with these thoughts that are on yeah. the screen right now. This is one of my favorite, um, favorite quotation from Peter Drucker which is if you can measure it, you can manage it. So even though the time tip is a difficult issue, once you have tools and processes for measuring it or tracking, then you can start doing things to improve it. And that's where really the whole thing starts. With the ad hoc processes and ad hoc you know, meta approaches, uh, that's not a good way to approach this thing. So it really comes from measuring. So with that in mind, um, really thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. At ePay Systems, we would like to be your human capital management provider and talk to you about the specific challenges that you're facing in your workforce management. Um, just let us know. So, uh, Hester, back to you. I'd like to thank our presenters as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archived recording and slides will be available for up to seven days for our free members and without restrictions for those with our certification membership. The webcast credit will show in your HR.com account within two business days. We will also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.